First things first, I want to thank some of my good friends, uh, Dr. Harris, Carmen, uh, Hisham, and uh, Baif Aladai Roy, sitting behind. Thanks for your support. Okay, before I get into my, my uh, talk, can I just play a video? Uh, this video actually pretty much explains uh, the, the, the project that I, what my project is all about. Uh, it's just a short video, and then after that, I'll, I'll get into it. 30 more years ago, as a parent, you know, your son wants to become a photographer. You, you feel a bit nervous. <laughs> Since he has got his book published, my wife and I are very, very proud of him. I'm Kenny Lo, a Malaysian photographer and a storyteller. And I guess this story begins with me retracing my steps from my boyhood days. From a simple trip to the barber shop I used to go to growing up, I'm now four years into my journey. Malaysia is filled with so many beautiful people. They all have stories, lessons that make our country what it is. I call them the unsung heroes of Malaysia. You know the interesting thing about people I meet? You don't know anything about them, but just a little time together, and we feel like old friends with many stories to share. I have this app that syncs all my notes and photos across all my devices. That way I can access my stories everywhere I go. My book, Born in Malaysia, is a collection of all these stories. But my dream is to see it turn into an app to which we can all share our stories. To use the internet to inspire Malaysians to know each other. Two years into my journey, I realized, wow, I have been all over Malaysia collecting people's stories. But I've never heard the story of someone that meant the world to me. So one day I asked him, Papa, tell me your story. And his reply, I thought you would never ask. It was such an honor to get to know him, not just as my father, but as a Malaysian. I believe every Malaysian can be an inspiration. Mine was right in front of me, all this while. Okay, uh, as you can see, I'm visibly younger there. That was uh, about four years ago. Um, this project uh, was something that uh, happened actually by accident. Uh, I had spent like 15 years working abroad. So when I came home to Malaysia, uh, decided to lepa, walk around, uh, and then just to find out uh, whether things that I knew as a young boy were still the same. Because my dad was a uh, government servant, and when we were younger, when we were young, he used to drive us everywhere, like not in the highways, but using the trunk roads. And uh, my recollection of Malaysia as a young boy was actually all these uh, tradespeople, the, the sundry shop owner, the grocery shop owners. Um, and uh, after close to 20 years uh, working abroad, I just wondering if those people are still here. Um, so I decided to travel. Um, it was only, I think, after about one and a half years that I was uh, actually uh, encouraged to do a book. I've never done a book, so I was like, no way, right? This is, this is not something I can do. But with a lot of encouragement and a lot of kick in the butt, I actually started to uh, collect those stories and uh, actually do very short interviews. Um, the, the result of actually the, the, the project is actually this book and uh, more recently the bigger book. Um, so, okay, let me just start. This project was started in 20, uh, 2009. Um, I'd been away for like 20 years, so this journey actually Sorry. Okay. Uh, one of the things that uh, we all know about uh, 
Malaysia is that last year we had our elections. Um, as a photographer, a lot of people always ask me, what is the thing that you learned most about Malaysia? Um, mine was very simple. Even after all these years, it was very simple. It was that every person in Malaysia, I don't care whether you're, what skin color you are, who you are, we just care about one thing, that we are able to feed our children, that they go to school, um, that they have a good life. I don't think anyone wakes up in the morning and says, uh, for, for instance, I'm a Chinese descendant, but I'm still Malaysian. I don't wake up in the morning and say, ah, let's uh, see, what can I do for the Chinese today? I don't say that. And neither do any of these people that I've covered through the years. Everyone has the same dream. And I think that last year was a good chance for us to actually make this dream a reality. So this photograph, actually, I spent uh, two months uh, following the actual, at that time, the opposition and now the government around Malaysia to shoot. And you can see, look at the joy on their faces. And this is the Malaysia that I love. And I sometimes feel pained when I see uh, when I read the news about how we are making a fuss out of uh, what to buy in the shops and all that, you know. Okay, anyway, on the first book, what I did was actually divide the book into uh, many chapters uh, according to Central, North, South, East and, and East Malaysia. I spent three years covering Malaysia. Uh, actually, After three years, I just have this silly little book, which is, well, actually, actually maybe I, I should have worked harder, but this was the result of actually three years of work. And uh, I went to every single state in the country, uh, including East Malaysia. Um, so all the states are represented in the book, except for Johor, uh, which I, I can't tell you why it's not in it. But So this was in the, in the longhouse in Sarawak. And I'm always uh, constantly uh, so uh, mes mesmerized by the fact that everywhere I go, people look so different, and yet we are still the same. Um, one of the things that, I, that really um, makes me feel a little bit well, emotional is that when I travel overseas, when I see a fellow Malaysian, whether he's Chinese or Indian or Orang Asli or Malay, whatever, you automatically know that that person is a Malaysian. And I don't know why it's that, but it's just we have this uh, Malaysianness about ourselves. But somehow transported back home, suddenly we are very aware that we are Malay, we are Chinese. Why is that? So uh, this is something that I still wonder. This was in uh, Long. Uh, this was in Sarawak. And most of the times I was just, uh, I didn't do very long interviews, just uh, maybe less than 300 words. But sometimes I would spend half a day or the whole day talking to that person and still going the old fashioned way by hand. And uh, one of the things that I, right before my eyes, I can see a lot of things disappearing. For instance, this guy. Uh, last keeper of the skulls. This was in uh, Sarawak. His job is actually to keep the skulls of all those people that they killed during the village wars. And because he's become Catholic, he, he will not do this job anymore. So uh, Malaysia is changing so fast, uh, either through religion or through other man-made uh, reasons. Okay, this was in Sabah. Uh, little boy there, very smart boy, because everywhere I shoot, he will always be on the side of the grandfather, where he's in the shade. But my book, uh, one of the things that makes it uh, uh, easier to understand is that every story has a coat. The horses are very shy. So a lot of people tell me that when they see my book, they don't really read, which is not a surprise, but the, usually the copy that the, the 
title is enough to tell them what I'm, I'm trying to say. Um, like in this case, I'm not rich, but I have no regrets. Uh, this was very interesting. This was in Ipoh. And I think that even now, if you travel around Malaysia, you will still find all these sort of uh, events, but mainly in the smaller towns. This could be a scene out of anywhere. China, you, Indonesia, you name it. But funny thing about this lady, when, before she goes onto the stage, she is actually looking at all the notes there, so she gets all the characters right. Um, this is a reflection of uh, where we are going because hardly anyone is interested in what she has to say. Everyone is like praying, putting jaws there and say, oh, please let me win the lottery, let my son do well in school. But it's, uh, no one is paying attention to her because she's speaking in uh, Cantonese, uh, a very kind of a deep Cantonese, which I, even I don't understand. Um, you can see this lady on the right. She's just uh, praying away. These two ladies were actually part of this. Uh, you can see them at the background. Uh, sometimes uh, I resorted to bribery. Like these two, I had to give, buy them bubble tea before they would pose for me. And this was uh, in Ipoh. Uh, Ipoh is a town I grew up in. And uh, even after all these years, Whenever I walk into a place to interview someone, I'm very nervous. And in this case, I was actually walking in front of the shop, up and down, up and down, trying to see if the guy is uh, friendly or unfriendly, you know, before I picked up enough courage to walk in. But when I walked in, he said, I remember cutting your hair. And uh, I don't know whether he says that to everyone, but yes, I suddenly cut my hair there. And... Uh, after that, I just spent the day with them. Um, if you look at that picture up there on the top corner there, uh, that's a photograph of, uh, this one is clearer, of uh, the barber shop in 1955 when his, great, uh, when his grandfather came and there were like uh, 18 barbers in that shop. And now there's left these two. And even the other guy, I didn't, I'm not so happy that I haven't cut my hair because his hands are shaking, you know, so anyway. So this is the, sh the road in uh, Ipoh, Belfield Road. Nowadays, we change all our roads to Jalan, uh, well, Maharaja, this, that, but I still call them by the old colonial names. This was the shop uh, about three years ago uh, because the shops have been uh, bought over and then they were being renovated. It's now a cafe. So this was the shop. I remember this scene very uh, clearly because this man, uh, Kiru, I was, I've been looking him for him for the longest time and when I arrived at this shop, I was just standing there looking at this. And then I heard someone stand, stand beside me and then I look at him and say, hey, Kiru, I've been looking for you. So the photographer me said, I got to put Kiru here in front of all these ruins and photograph him. Then something told me, you know, there's certain things that are very sacred. Uh, these sort of relationships and I just put my camera down and just enjoyed the moment with him. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when they took down the barber shop, the big photograph of him with his grandfather uh, was lost. So I actually had a photograph of it, which I printed out for him. Um, I think it, all, it stands uh, proudly in his shop now. This place is now called uh, Sekeping Kong Hing. I think if anyone has been to Ipoh, you probably stayed there. Uh, but he's, he only has a single seat, uh, small little barber shop there now. Uh, this was the optician who was in the same row, star optician, star barber. And this is another gentleman, Ipo, mixed rubber stamps. Uh, one of the things I always do is I always travel and visit the same people that I photograph through the years. And uh, sometimes I've come across scenes where uh, she said, oh, he's not here anymore. I said, where is he? They're like, he's just not here. So I know some of them have passed away. Uh, some of them have just retired. 
in this case, I came back to this shop uh, three years later, and this is what I see. And it's sad because when you go there, you can still feel what it was like with him when he was there. You can see all the letter, uh, the the typesetting. And this is another guy. Uh, it's one of the only bars in Malaysia that has a uh, one of those uh, revolving doors like that. Okay, the ferryman. Uh, this was in a little town uh, near uh, called Sabak Sabak Burnham, I believe. Uh, again, when I travel. Uh, I always take all the little roads and I encourage everyone to do that because then you come across things like this. This is a ferry that goes from the Klapa Sawit, the plantation, to the town. And this was in Penang. This man is still around, I think. I see his things every time I see his shop in Penang. But um, yeah, White, with a signboard, people knew who you were. Throughout my travels in Malaysia, even in Ipoh, there are shops like this, but uh, they are usually closed or on the way to, to, to being closed. And this was in Penang. This lady was in, uh, is in Penang. Uh, I was lucky that she was there because uh, in Malaysia, it's so hot. Even without the haze, it's super hot. And I sometimes I get so caught up with shooting that I don't drink water and all that. And I knew I was going to have, have heat stroke. So I staggered into a shop and said, Lady, can you please keep my, keep my cameras? I see I had a good sense. And then after that, I fainted. So I woke up, she was like there for me uh, with hot tea and all. So after that, uh, even then, Two years later, when the book was ready, I, I went back and gave her a copy of the book. These two ladies uh, in Penang, uh, Tanjung Bunga, was very touching because uh, when I photographed them, I didn't ask them to hold hands, but immediately they, they just started to hold each other's hand. And uh, the story is that both of them, when they were about uh, in their 30s, both their husbands passed away early. So through, the, through that time, they've always been side by side. You can see, you can see the, the two stalls in Tanjung Bunga. And why, why is she looking so sheepish here? Is because even though this photograph was taken three years before, when I saw her, she actually refused to let me photograph her. And then I knew why. Because she was wearing the same, same uh, blouse. Three years later, uh, still in good condition. And this guy in Penang, when I walked in here, just who is Lady Gaga? Because you can see they're selling all the Hindi albums and the Tamil albums. I went in there being Chinese, it gave me one of those look like, like uh, you know what we're selling here, right? I said, so I asked, do you know who is Lady Gaga? I said, no, I don't. Okay, then, then we're... Uh, something in common. So I spent the time uh, just talking to him. This guy is in Pekan Sungai Bersi in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, there's a place in Pe uh, Kuala Lumpur called Pekan Sungai Bersi where there are the most number of barbers. There must be at least uh, 60 barbers at that place. And only because there's an army camp close by, there's a police camp. Uh, so there are a lot of men going for the haircuts all the time. But I've got just the right song for you. Why is that? Because whoever sits in that chair, he'll play the music for you. And when I sat there, he played Chinese music, which I was like, oh, okay, this is really old stuff. Uh, but just to test him, I waited till the next chap who was Indian, and he had me Indian music. What a guy. And I still keep in touch with him. Sometimes, sometimes I still go there and cut my hair, but my partner is always uh, quite insistent that I don't because it comes up all, all weird and all that. Uh, compassion in action. These are the sort of Malaysians I'm really proud of. Uh, makes me, this lady is out uh, once a week cutting the hair of the homeless. And you would imagine the homeless, they, most of them don't get a lot of time to uh, opportunity to have a shower and all that. Oh, she's out there cutting the hair. 
And even the homeless lady, this lady came out, oh, do you know that latest hair in that movie? I want it cut like that. So one of the things I learned about this is that you may be homeless, but doesn't mean you don't have pride in yourself. So one of the things I, I did with uh, Chick Asmina when we had uh, another talk, I said that she gave the sense of dignity back to the homeless. Of course, that made her cry, but uh, currently she's at uh, uh, a place in KL where Jan Raja Lao area. She's actually built portable showers. So now the homeless can go in there for a little shower before they go for the haircut. And these people do it all with no concern about payment or anything. It's all, it's all uh, voluntary work. This is the Malaysia I know. Uh, this lady uh, is a big, huge bookstore in, the, uh, in KL. Four-story, second-hand bookstore. Uh, she's like a hu human computer. You can be downstairs. You ask her for a book, she'll tell you, okay, second floor, third shelf, you know. Uh, but she actually scared me this time because I, until this day, I remember the shop was really dark. When I went in there, I didn't see her because you can see her. The blouse she's wearing, the stripes there, I didn't see her. When I finally saw her, I was like, oh, shit, <laughs> who's this? <laughs> anyway, just some of the things I enjoy. Uh, many of you would know this one, Coliseum. Uh, this is one of the few times I cheated. I actually had that girl uh, work on the tablecloth a couple of times. Uh, this gentleman sadly uh, found out a year ago that he's, he's gone to heaven. Okay, this bookshop, uh, three years ago, uh, the, uh, actually five years ago in uh, Jan Sultan, just close by here, there's a hotel called uh, Lok An Hotel. And this shop was right out there. And you can see on the left-hand side, that's the picture of his father. And then now uh, he's sitting there, but the shop is gone already. Uh, when the subway was being built in Kuala Lumpur, they took over the hotel, and then after that he closed his shop. He went back to India, and his son told me that a few months later, uh, when he came back, he already passed away. So I was thinking, this is something that's recurring. I, it's not scientific, but every time I visit my, uh, the, my subjects, I always hear this very common thing, which is that, oh, they stop working and then they pass away. So I think perhaps it's the work that keeps us going. Actually, I use that photograph in my KL book. So that's him still immortalized there. Uh, this is also again uh, close by uh, in the just off Padang Street, uh, Kunke. It's, it's a Ciso Lane is because my dad told me that road is not called Lorong Hang Lekil, it's called Ciso Lane. So I'll call it that. This is in Kampung Baru. Kampung Baru is one of the last enclaves. If you go there, uh, try to avoid all the construction. It actually seems like it's a small kampung anywhere in Malaysia. You can see how it is. Over here, I managed to capture the guy going by in the car. Uh, he didn't have any teeth. He was smiling back at him. And these two, The original quote for this photograph was, my balls are bigger than yours. And uh, I'm referring to that one. Because when I had this father and son, when they sat there, uh, he just threw the small ball to the son and said, oh, these are yours, you know. And then he took the big one. So but my publisher said I, I shouldn't say things like that there. So anyway, my father grows younger as he grows older. And uh, the writer, my, the, my book editor, these are her parents. They, they're Baba Nonya. And this shirt that he wears was uh, sewn by the, the wife. So I lost touch with them for a number of years. Um, 
But uh, when I was asked uh, two years ago to attend his wake, so I went to see my friend, you know, I said, oh, I'm sorry about your dad. Then she said, oh, no, he's had a good life uh, and all that. So I said, do you mind if I look in the coffin? So I looked in and he was wearing this shirt. Right after that, my friend and I, we were crying our eyes out. And uh, these are the simple things about my work that makes it worthwhile for what I do. I don't make a lot of money uh, yet. I don't know if I have more time, but the stories that I have are in my mind and I'll always remember it. Uh, this is one of the people I really respect. Um, Joseph Gonzalez, he's a teacher, a uh, dance instructor, but he's in Hong Kong now. Apparently, the pay is much better there. So, but yeah, many dancers in Malaysia owe their success to him. Things of value should last forever. This is one uh, place in Malacca. I, I think sometimes we try too hard to uh, uh, modernize. Because this shop, can you look at it? Look at the walls. Uh, the paint is very old, you know, it's coming off. Uh, grandfather clocks are on the wall. Uh, the last time I saw him two years ago, the shop had become white walls, nothing on the wall, and glass and chrome. So uh, I think sometimes we, we just uh, try too, f too hard, too fast to, to, to uh, change or welcome change. For example, this place, Sinsita is in Malacca. This is currently a cafe also. Uh, this gentleman on the right hand side is not with us anymore, but again, uh, the new cafe only has the, the signboard. Everything else there inside is gone. So uh, I, I can't say that I don't welcome change, but uh, yeah. But one of the things that uh, I remember was uh, one gentleman who, who makes rattan furniture, he, he asked me, he said, so do you expect us to sit around here for you guys to come and photograph us? Oh, I was like, oh, no, not us. Then uh, I realized that a lot of times when we travel, we see these sort of interesting things. We just photograph it. Can, maybe you can just sit down and ask a few questions. They're always very happy to speak to you. But uh, we go in there, take the picture, and then we leave. And then that's it. This is a shop in Malacca selling a, their Chinese wine importer. So you can see the big bottles of wine and, and all that. Uh, this gentleman on the right, uh, both of them actually, they would read, because they don't have iPad or, or internet or anything, they would read four different newspapers, front to back, back to front, four times a day. Uh, this is them at it. And the last time I went there two years ago, the gentleman on the left was still there, sitting in the same position. This guy wasn't there. Uh, the seat was empty. There were people walking around him, sitting around him, but no one would dare to sit in that chair. So I would assume uh, he has also gone to meet his maker. This lady also, uh, she's not with us anymore. And... Uh, it's profound sadness that I visit all these places again because every time I go there, I'm so, like really expecting them to be there, but uh, uh, she's already gone. But the shop is still there. It's a tea shop in Malacca. This gentleman uh, is in a shop right next to the tea lady. What he does is repair sewing machines. He was telling me, when I went to this shop, uh, there was only him and him alone. But he was telling me in the heyday, in the, in the 60s, 70s, even up to the 80s, there were 25 people working in the shop. Everyone repairing sewing machines. And after they were done, they would just put the machine on a bicycle and then they would deliver it to the shop, uh, whoever wanted the machine to be repaired. This lady was quite a surprise because um, Again, uh, the husband makes uh, this thing called uh, Teochew porridge. So uh, last year I was in Malacca, so I walked past this shop. It was closed, 
But then this lady picked out the shop and said, Oh, we're closed. Come back in an hour's time. So I was damn happy, you know. So went on, you know. Then I went further down to the tea lady's shop and the daughter said, uh, he said, where are you having lunch? I said, having uh, tea, uh, porridge at that place down a few doors away. Then she looked around and she said, it's been closed for years. Huh? So her husband has passed away, but every day she's still there greeting people who come. Uh, I guess she's uh, probably senile or something. But uh, a lot of things, they just start out with a uh, vocation and then they end their, when the end of their lives, they are still in the same vocation. This is in the Trungano. Pope Hassan again has uh, passed away a number of years ago, but he used to make these boats by, ha by hand without any nails. He is one of four men in the uh, in uh, Pulau Duyong in Trungano, who know how to build these boats by hand. Uh, sadly, he's not with, him, with us anymore. I know one of the local universities uh, documented his skill, but uh, I don't think we're in a position, because right now, he was telling me that he competes against people who make boats with fiberglass. So yeah, that's another down to history. That's his granddaughter, following him around. Again, this is the back of the boatyard. This was a fisherman in the, uh, again in East Malaysia, uh, in uh, Kelantan, this was in Kelantan. And this man, this sundry shop has been there since his great, great grandfather and uh, you can see a Tesco open up further down the road. So now all he does is sell like sardine and the uh, liquor for the estate workers. Uh, this business ends with him because his two kids are in KL working as IT consultants. So that's another little part of history. Go on. This was in uh, Kota Baru. Uh, it's the only place where there's a U-shaped table. This place used to be a, uh, a, a hotel, a Japanese hotel. That's why they have that Japanese style. But uh, you can see the multicultural aspect of Malaysia. Puppet master. Uh, sometimes I have some really interesting things like uh, this couple here. When I ask them to hold hands, they were really shy. I never been married like 20 years. So I realized that they don't hold hands at all. But when they did so, this is a sort of expression. So these are the things that, I, that gives me a lot of joy. Uh, I'm not a matchmaker, but... Yeah, you can see that how they were just strolling down. This was in, uh, in Sabrang Pai, uh, which is the north part of Malaysia. And uh, I'm currently working on a book on the Orang Asli. So I've uh, been spending a lot of time with them. Uh, this was in Cameron Highlands, going up to the Cameron Highlands. They're just selling honey, uh, mushrooms. Um, the mushrooms I don't dare to try because I don't know what sort it is, but uh, fringe dwellers. And this is, the Orang Asi to me are, are like that because we keep on pushing them against them in the sense that we are destroying the forest. So they're coming out to meet us, not by choice. This is just a young man. He's only 32 years old, but he's got like eight kids. All those are his kids. These are uh, Orang Asli children that I work with uh, for a dormitory, an NGO that I, that I volunteer with. Uh, we build dormitories for Orang Asli children so that they may live there for free and we send them to school every day. Orang Asli children. Uh, this is a cover, of course, the cover of my KL book. Uh, this time around, the KL book 
uh, it's not according to geographical areas, but you can see heroes. Uh, I think that's uh, pretty self-explanatory. Change makers, pendatang. Pendatang means, uh, and I, it's tongue in cheek because uh, we've been called, people like me, Chinese, have been called pendatang. So, yeah. Uh, even Dan Lang Lang in Malaysia, we have, if you fill out a form, if you're not Malay, Chinese, Indian, usually there's a Dan Lang Lang. So, yeah, that's something that I think we need to change. This is in Kuala Lumpur. This is all part of Kuala Lumpur. And this lady here, every time this uh, blind lady, she sells tissue paper on the roadside. But every time she comes in, this lady will shout her name uh, like, Mona, Mona. And then she'll run to another spot and shout again, Mona. And this blind lady is like looking around. And then finally she gets there and then she senses that she's there. And then when she holds her hand, this is the look of delight on the face. Still remember, remember this shot very well. Uh, this was a very heavy downpour in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, it looked like some shot from a Japanese manga comic, but uh, I suddenly hope they're a, cu a couple, uh, they're a real couple and not, you know. Uh, Queen of all trades, um, close by Pataling Street, PS150, there's a little bar there. Uh, now it's not so little, but it's actually very popular. So Angel is, uh, was a bartender there. She's left to set up her own place. And this story I have to, I have to tell you guys because uh, what this place is, is actually a container. Uh, one of those shipping containers. Half a shipping container. And there are 16 men living there. And how did they cram them up there? Because they have uh, tables in, the, in, in that container. So some sleep on top, some sleep below. Uh, sadly, this is in a construction yard managed by one of the listed uh, developers in Malaysia. So um, we are just turning a blind eye to uh, the plight of the refugees. These are Rohingyas. But this place, uh, when you walk in there, is full of mud. It's mud up to here. Uh, I couldn't go in as a photographer, so I went in like a uncle looking for a carpenter, so they let me in. But further down the road, uh, there's another container where there are women sitting outside. There are sex workers there, catering to the, these construction workers. Uh, there's people cooking there, not in a very hygienic uh, way, but a listed construction company having your workers stay in this sort of condition is uh, deplorable. It's, it's, it's a disgrace. Um, Kuala Lumpur has become a, a magnet for refugees only because I think as a refugee, you can come to Malaysia fairly easily. You can just walk in, uh, you, you get a three-month uh, visa, I believe. This man here is an artist from Iran. And this is a good friend of mine, uh, Hisham there. Uh, so his story uh, reminds, uh, best exemplifies uh, the Malaysia that I believe is out there. Because um, Hisham used to stay beside this lady called uh, Susan. Uh, one is Chinese, one is Malay, you know. Doesn't matter. But Alan punya best friend sudah tak ada. Hidup pun sudah tak ada shock. It's like this... Uh, Susan's mother uh, said this after Hisham's mother passed away. They were like siblings. So, um, I, I wish I could uh, have more time to show you the sort of photos I have of this, of this story, but this is the sort of Malaysia that I, that I wish for. Uh, this is an interracial relationship. She's Malay and he's Indian. He's Catholic. Uh, I only see him as a man. But uh, their story is that constantly she's being told by her family and her friends, surely you can do better than that. Uh, a guy, Indian guy, and then his family also tells her the same thing, surely you can find a good Catholic girl. So 
is this sort of religious, uh, uh, con the way we're trying to put people in, in little segments of society, but why can't we just let people be what they want to be? So this story, when I photographed them, they told me their story, they were very happy, but suddenly they'll be sad because thinking of what the future is, and they have no future here if they wanted to be a couple. And she's very adamant that he doesn't change his religion because of her. Uh, this, I just had to put this photo in because of my friend Roy there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know in Malaysia, uh, many years ago, Standard Chartered had this uh, uh, ad campaign called Big Strong and Friendly. They always have this Punjabi guy there, you know, with the moustache and all that. So when I came across this guy, I was like, oh my god, yeah. But I love faces. Uh, this is a Rohingya uh, man, uh, trafficked seven times. Um, currently, he's working in Malaysia, but uh, I was told that from Cox Bazaar in Bangladesh, he was trafficked by one group, handed from one group to another till he arrived in Malaysia. And throughout, the people who were handing him over were men in uniform because in Thailand, Thailand Malaysia border, he was with a group of uh, men who, who were in uniform. Then they transferred them to a group of men in Malaysia who were also in uniform. So I, I don't want to speculate who those people are. Uh, so long as we don't have, uh, uh, we don't allow foreign uh, refugees to work legally here. This is what happens. Because a lot of these refugees, this guy is from Bangladesh. Uh, he was working in a factory, battery factory. Um, there was an explosion and he lost his eye. And then his employer just patched him up and wanted to send him back, but he refused to go back. He wanted to come here, stay on and fight for his rights. And there are NGOs around that are, who are doing that now. Uh, this man, uh, Bangladesh, she, 10 years in Malaysia, never met my wife. Why? Because uh, he's, uh, after he came here, he was in an arranged marriage. Uh, he hasn't been able to afford to go back to see her. So they communicate initially through the phone and now through uh, video. So it makes me feel very fortunate of the life I have. Again, uh, Somali, there's a place in Gomba, the entire uh, flat is just full of Somali refugees. Um, Michelle Yasudas is a lawyer for Amnesty, uh, used to be. And this guy here, uh, for the past six years, uh, he's been carrying the Kavadi in remembrance of his father. Because they were supposed to carry it together. Because when you carry a kawadi, you have your friends close by to help you when you need to rest. They put a chair under you, uh, they massage your feet and all that. Unfortunately, his father didn't live to see his first uh, typosum. Uh, these two uh, Silat teachers are that gentleman, Hisham's kids. That's Silap, and that one is Silap. Lim Kit Siang, whom I followed uh, for two months before and after the election. Uh, he's the one in the black and white photograph at the start of the talk. And this current project I'm working on is on the Orang Asli of Peninsular Malaysia. If you look at their faces, they have these are ne Negritos. Um, the diversity that is Malaysia, uh, rather than celebrating it, we, are s we tend to be so afraid of it. I, I don't know why. Look at this scene here. You can't even imagine that this is in Malaysia, but it is. This is the sort of uh, Malaysians that we have, and we should celebrate. And this is in Berlin. Quiet morning, the raft is built of bamboo, 
And just this that father teaching his two kids how to uh, go on the lake. And finally, my dad, uh, second from the right, uh, my aunt on the left has already passed away. So I end it with uh, this picture. My great grandfather came from China. So uh, I worked in China and uh, Taiwan for like about 15 years. When I was there, I always identified myself as Malaysian. And even in China, when I was working there, you would assume that being Chinese ori origin, I would be very comfortable in China, but no. Because I am Malaysian first. So uh, this is something that I, I just identify with. Okay, this is that. Uh, any questions? I hate to say this, but don't be shy. No questions? Roy? Since I know you, or oh, Hisham, don't be hiding there. Can you give the mic to that man behind there, Roy? Ask a question, point six. <laughs> okay, that gentleman there, Hisham. The Botak guy there. <laughs> you guys are big strong men, all like so shy. Okay. Okay, my question is, what's next? The Orang Asli book uh, is taking me uh, throughout Malaysia. We have uh, 18 diverse, uh, 18 individual tribes in Malaysia, all speaking eight, their own dialect. So uh, it's going to be quite an adventure. Any more questions? Oh, if not, I will end it here. Thank you very much. Uh, the books are available downstairs in the in the shop if you if you like, and I'll be there uh, to sign it. Thank you.